We have uh, Lee Shang presenting um, on her tool called SHARE. Lee, Dr. Shang is an associate professor in the Department of Mathematics and Computer Science and the Department of Biomedical Informatics at Emory University, where she directs the Assured Inform Information Management and Sharing Research Group. Her research areas are in data privacy and security, distributed data management, and bio and health informatics. Please welcome Dr. Shang. Thank you, Michelle, for the introduction. Uh, I would also like to thank you, Lucila, thank the IDASH team, and thank everybody for the opportunity to be here. Um, I should probably add that I'm actually taking my part-time sabbatical leave here uh, at IDASH, so I'm very happy to be here. Um, so this is a project um, which comes out of uh, my NSF-funded project. Is a, I would say it's an extension or spin-off, um, which I'm closely working with the team here at IDASH, um, Xiao Qian and Lucila, um, to evaluate some of the algorithms we developed for um, differentially private data release, um, as well as further developing algorithms that are driven by um, the characteristics or challenges presented by the biomedical data. Um, so the project is called SHARE, um, stands for Statistical Health Information Release with Differential Privacy. Um, it's an ongoing project, the system we're trying to build. Um, um, as Cynthia quickly introduced yesterday, the differential privacy is a rigorous notion for privacy guarantee. Um, what I'll do today is to, I'm sure Cynthia can do a better job, but I'll try to make an attempt to uh, further or present a more detailed definition of the differential privacy for the audience who are not familiar with it, um, and then present a quick overview of the project and um, present some quick um, use case studies and discuss some challenges. Um, as we all know, um, protecting the privacy of our patients or our subjects um, for disseminated data for secondary use, such as research, uh, is very important. A traditional approach is usually called the identification or microdata release. Um, given the original um, health records, um, we can sanitize the data by removing the identifiers, such as name and social security number and all that, according to the HIPAA safe harbor uh, methods, or uh, some of the attributes can be generalized to satisfy the statistical um, de identification principles. Um, however, as um, been shown by many works, um, these microdata or microdata release or de identification approaches are subject to many re identification or disclosure risks um, because these seemingly de identified data can be joined with external um, information such as registry um, data and so on to re-identify the people. Um, Xiao Qian has shown a very quick example yesterday. A more recent example has been shown in the science article this year. Um, by taking the genome data from the 1000 Genome Project, um, the researchers did a profile of the short tandem repeats on the Y chromosomes of the uh, genome, and then they query the recreational gen um, genealogy databases, which actually allow them to recover the last names or the surnames because people inherit their Y chromosomes from their father who have the same last names. And then by combining the surname and other metadata, such as age and state, uh, they are able to identify 50 profiles from the um, genome project. So this is just an example um, that shows, again, um, if we don't do the anonymization or sanitization carefully, um, there are real disclosure risks. So another um, alternative approach that we're taking um, is statistical data release or macro data release. Um, in this case, given the original health records, we're only going to uh, release the aggregate or statistics from the data. Um, however, if we don't do, do if we don't do this carefully, there's also disclosure risks. So here's a very simple example that, that I'm going to use to illustrate the risk. Um, the left-hand side shows a um, set of um, medical records with their names and age and whether they're HIV positive attribute. And then the right-hand side shows the um, histogram based on the attribute age. So um, for each age group, we show the number of patients um, that have HIV positive for that age range or age group. 
So we might think uh, if we just release this histogram, there's no disclosure risk because there's no individual data that are involved. It's only aggregates. Um, however, if we consider an adversary who knows everybody in a data set, except that she or he doesn't know whether Alice is in a data set. So consider the um, bottom case where we have everybody um, that are the same with the database that's shown above, except Alice is in this <coughs> second data set. So if we release the same histogram uh, of the count of patients for each um, group, then the only difference between the two histograms is the number of patients for the age group 40 and 45. The first one shows two and the second one shows three because Alice has HIV positive attribute. So considering that an adversary knows everybody except Alice, by looking at and comparing these two histograms, she will be able to deduce Alice has positive HIV attribute if she knows the age of Alice. So this is just an extreme example that shows the disclosure risk of statistical uh, data release or aggregate data release. So differential privacy is a um, privacy notion that's proposed for such purposes to address such uh, disclosure risk. It um, provides a rigorous guarantee by ensuring that for any databases that differ in one record, in this case Alice, the resulting histogram should be indistinguishable. So in that case, the adversary looks at these two histograms which are perturbed um, in some way. They can, he can distinguish the difference between these two so, so that he can deduce whether Alice is in the database or not. So basically the notion is to give an indistinguishability independent of uh, any particular given record, uh, the absence or presence of that record. So more um, formally, uh, the definition goes like follows. Given two neighboring database D and D prime, which um, differs in only one record, X sub N plus one, uh, we call this neighboring databases. A privacy mechanism A gives epsilon differential privacy if for all the neighboring database pairs, for all possible outputs S um, in a range, the probability of the output um, of the sanitization mechanism maps to a range the, from the two neighboring databases is bounded by a multiplicative factor, um, e to the epsilon. And epsilon in this case is the level of the privacy. Um, in, we also call it a privacy budget. So the higher the epsilon, the higher the difference between from the uh, two neighboring databases, such so that the privacy level is actually lower. The lower epsilon, the higher the privacy. So a common mechanism to achieve the differential privacy is called Laplace mechanism. Given any function such as the count query, such as the number of patients within certain age group, um, given the original answer f from d, uh, we would add a Laplace noise to the original answer. And this Laplace noise is calibrated based on the epsilon, which is the privacy level, and the global sensitivity of that function. So the global sensitivity of the function is defined as the maximum difference between the two neighboring databases uh, for that function. So you can consider um, it's really, in a way, reflects the impact of any particular individual on that function. Okay, so given the count query, for example, the um, difference is just one. Um, and the epsilon decides also the magnitude of the noise. So the lower the epsilon, um, the higher the noise. And the higher epsilon, the lower the noise. Um, and given this mechanism, um, we can actually, given any query, right, given any count query, given any statistics we want to compute, we can add the noise based on the computation and achieve differential privacy uh, with level epsilon. However, if we want to um, compute a set of statistics or a set of computations, there's a nice property of differential privacy. That's what makes it powerful, the composition properties. So given a set of or sequence of queries, if each of them guarantees epsilon i differential privacy, the sequence would guarantee the sum of the epsilon i differential privacy. So the composition makes it nice um, such that we can actually uh, compute a set of um, statistics and still have a very good understanding of the accumulated privacy level that we're going to achieve. And another nice property is the parallel uh, composition. When each of the query is issued to a disjoint subset of the data, then the total differential privacy level is just the maximum of the epsilon i. So this property has been used in many algorithmic development so that we can take advantage of this um, um, 
property to define or to design more um, accurate um, algorithms that uh, maintain more utility of the data. Um, so given that background, now the question is, given the original data records, we want to be able to release a set of statistics so that the researchers and, and analysts can use those statistics, or we can even generate a set of synthetic records that mimic the original data based on the statistics so that uh, the researchers can be um, using the data. Now the question is, what statistics do we compute, right? What statistical properties do we want to maintain, do we want to preserve? And given the set of statistics to compute, how do we apportion or allocate the privacy budget among the different computations such that the overall privacy level is epsilon that's, um, that can be defined by the data custodian or data users? So in our project, um, we're trying to build a prototype system called SHARE. Um, that takes advantage of different types of the data and driven by different applications um, in the biomedical studies. Um, typically, we have um, very high dimensional data um, or longitudinal data that have um, repeated observations of the same variable and of the same patients. So in order to deal with these challenges, to tackle these challenges, uh, we have built several um, preliminary components in this um, data set. So for example, we have some components to release um, histograms for low dimensional data and for releasing high dimensional joint distributions uh, for high dimensional data. And we have some other techniques um, that can release um, longitudinal patterns of sequential data. All of these are driven by um, very common uh, applications such as cross-sectional studies and longitudinal studies uh, in the biomedical studies. So um, there has been a lot of histogram methods that are being um, um, proposed, and in addition to the methods we developed on our own, we're also implementing uh, some other state-of-the-art methods in our system. So for today's talk, uh, what I'll do is to just give a very quick overview of the, one of the components for sequential data release. How can we uh, release uh, statistics from a sequential data set uh, such that we preserve the temporal or longitudinal patterns from the data? Um, so what do we mean by sequential data? Um, this are typically um, involve the longitudinal observations of the same variable uh, of the same patient. Um, or we can think of it as genome sequences, another, another example. So here shows a, an example data set where we have, again, the name of the patient and then the blood pressure history uh, of the patient at different time points, T1, T2, and T3. Um, they could be at different events, right? You could think of it as um, event A, event B, event C. For example, event A can be admission to the hospital, event B can be discharged, event C can be readmission of the hospital. So in order to, so all of these data can be represented as a sequential data set like this. And we wanna be able to release the uh, statistics from the data set by um, differential privacy. However, we want to preserve the temporal patterns so we are able to answer um, or uh, address questions such as what's the frequent pattern? What are the events that are uh, typically associated with each other? And which event is often followed by another event and so on. So the approach we are taking is a prefix-based, uh, prefix tree-based approach where we can represent all the patterns by a prefix tree um, from the data set. Here, um, based on the left um, data set, we have a prefix tree on the right-hand side. Um, each level corresponds to a time point in a data set. So at the root level, we have um, all the records, which um, is 100. And then at the next level, at time T1, we are going to count how many patients um, starts with the pattern L, which corresponds to the low blood pressure, and how many patients start with N at T1, at time T1, uh, which corresponds to normal um, blood pressure, and how many patients start with H, um, which corresponds to high blood pressure. Um, and then at time point two, we're gonna count how many patients start with L at T1 and um, have N or um, N at T2, and so on. So you can see at each node, um, we have a prefix pattern, um, for example, NN, and then we have the count of patients that corresponds to the total number of patients that exhibit that prefix pattern. 
Um, and the nice thing about this prefix tree is that at any given node, for example, given the NL at time two, meaning we have zero patient that exhibit a pattern of N and L, uh, corresponding to time point T1 and T2, then there's no need to expand that node further because there won't be any um, patients that have the prefix NL followed by any other patterns. Um, and by doing this, we can actually save some budget when we allocate a budget, um, privacy budget. And another nice thing is that each of the branch is actually disjoint from each other because a patient have L at T1, they will not have patient, uh, pattern N at T1. So each of the branch is uh, disjoint with each other, so we can apply the parallel composition uh, property of the differential privacy on this. However, on each of the branch, we do have to accumulate the privacy um, because they're correlated. So we have several uh, budget allocation strategies, such as linear, exponential, and so on. I won't go into the detail of this. Um, a recent extension we have made is also to use some model to guide us to do the budget allocation. For example, if we can learn a Markov model for the transition of the events from a consented subset of the sample, or uh, we can learn it dynamically from noisy data, then we can apply that to help us um, allocate the budget more smartly. Um, so we did a very quick uh, use case study um, on the EMER data, which stands for Emory Electronic Medical Records Prescription Data Set. It um, includes the um, physician ID uh, of all the Emory doctors or physicians, and then the average number of e-prescription per patient visit for each month that's prescribed by that physician. So here just shows a random subset of the um, data sets. Um, one, the first one shows um, this physician has a increasing pattern of e-prescriptions over the month. So the x-axis is actually over two year of uh, period. Um, and each data point shows each month. Um, and we also observe some other patterns, like constant pattern or zigzag patterns uh, in this data set. So we apply this DP tree and or DP try, and then we um, evaluated the result by uh, asking temporal trend queries. For example, how many doctors um, are are having um, two e prescriptions in month one, and four e prescriptions in month two, and four uh, five e prescriptions on month three and so on. So this is just an example of the temporal queries we can answer from this release, the statistics or data sets. And turns out um, the DP try or the differentially private data release does preserve some of the temporal patterns. And in many cases, it's um, fairly close to the original data. And the longer the query length, um, of course, the meaning the longer the pattern, the temporal pattern, um, the absolute count of uh, physicians exhibiting that pattern is smaller. So the error actually is also smaller. So this is basically what this figure shows. And again, I won't go into the details of this figure, but I want to show, um, so I'll skip this. This is some new development we have. But I really want to show, uh, or what I really want to discuss is that um, Based on our experience, how we felt is the differentially private statistical data release um, have demonstrated utility for certain applications. It's very good for, for example, counting queries or simple histograms, or in the temporal sequential data case, it actually preserves some temporal patterns. Um, so we envision it's going to be very useful in several scenarios, for example, for cohort discovery uh, of the patients or for um, simple evaluation of hypotheses or exploratory analysis for even formulating hypothesis uh, or algorithm evaluation before the researchers has the need to get the real data so that it will speed up the discovery process. However, there are also some challenges. For example, the data can be heterogeneous. We have uh, both um, demographic attributes combined with um, the temporal longitudinal attributes. How do we handle this kind of data? And data can be distributed across multiple dis um, institutions, which has been addressed by several researchers here. And finally, how do we um, 
educate the end users so that they can properly set or even specify the privacy budget. So we're looking also at a direction which we want to empower the patients so that they can customize their own um, privacy level, or privacy budget, or even uh, put a price on their personal data based on the sensitivity of the data. So those are some directions we're working on. Um, with that, I'll have a de-identified acknowledgement of my research team and students and collaborators. So um, these are real people I want to acknowledge. And I'll conclude and thank you. Oh wait, can you ask the question in the mics? Thanks. For, for someone who's not well informed uh, on how, well, how broadly applied these uh, features are, is the use of the uh, epsilon by the uh, data custodians, data owners, is that becoming uh, more accepted or implemented in, you know, in, in practice? Um, I've seen, I've seen uh, some large data owners sort of empirically uh, add some noise to data sets for research purposes, but the actual metrics that they are using or the uh, haven't been very clear to me. Um, that's a very good question. Um, that's actually uh, one of the goals our project um, has. Um, so differential privacy, like, um, uh, Cynthia has mentioned, there are a lot of algorithmic development um, in the computer science community. However, in practice, we haven't really seen any um, systems that are being used. Correct me if any of you. So except the data map project that's being used by the Census um, Bureau, right? That one for sure, yeah. Yeah. Really? Interesting. Mm -hmm. The differential privacy noise. Right. Interesting. That would be interesting to find out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but um, getting back to your question, yes, um, setting up epsilon. Uh, at least to my own experience, um, it's still a challenge. Um, how do we make it intuitive and how do we make it um, something that's tangible and understandable by the end users? Um, so one direction I personally find very interesting is the pricing theory, um, So which actually maps the sensitivity of the data to some pricing scheme so the end users can actually place a price tag on your data depending on how sensitive or how um, your data is an outlier versus if your data is very common, then you should charge a higher price for your data if your data is an outlier, which is important to the overall data, says, data set and is easier to be identified. Um, so we're looking at some of those directions. Uh, thank you. And also, can I just ask, anytime there's a question or a comment, to please speak into the mic when you're in the audience? Uh, this way, anyone that's wa watching on the web can hear your question and comment. Uh, 